Shalom, shalom, and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry with myself, Aaliyah, coming to you from sunny South Africa, you know, during lockdown. And I know that many of us are facing some incredibly challenging times, lockdowns, quarantines, world change as we know it. And I just want to, you know, as we are sitting here today and we are joining together, obviously not to talk about this, but to go into a wonderful teaching, which is going to be an incredible blessing for us today. But I really just want to start off by saying that I really pray, Abba Father's richest blessings over you at this time that you and your family or just even you find yourself in because these are challenging moments and challenging times for all of us. And, you know, we have to face sometimes emotions that are, are messy and real and our realities are not always easy. And so I really want to pray, Abba Father's grace and his love and his comfort for all of us. And as we spend this time together in his word, I pray that that this beautiful teaching that we are going to be sharing sharing today that's got nothing to do with anything that's happening in our world right now but is really a teaching from the word of Abba Father that it will really be a place of pause for you just taking your mind into the scriptures your heart just experiencing something new because you know what today is going to be a very different kind of teaching because I'm going to be challenging you know long held thoughts on someone that we you know don't often think about in terms of a positive light but someone who actually did do something that was quite courageous and quite incredible and that really does speak to our lives today and so Vashti and Xerxes that's what we're going to be talking about today before we do that let us just close our eyes just for a moment and pray together Abba Father, we thank you so, so much that no matter where we are in the world, that we can be joined together by your spirit. I thank you so much today that one thing that never changes, even through the ups and the downs, Father, it's you and your heart of love and compassion towards us. Thank you that you hold all of our experiences in your hand. And I pray that all of our experiences, our emotions, our thoughts will have meaning, deep meaning, and that you'll bring meaning to those things. Today, as we gather around your words still our hearts still everything around us and father teach us something new and beautiful and special and unique from your word today that we can just draw from draw into and learn from today we are so grateful for you father we are so grateful for your word because it's truth and it always remains constant in an ever-changing world you're sure we give you all the glory and praise invite you into this space in your mighty name we pray amen so Vashti and Xerxes, well, you know what? This is a beautiful teaching in the word of Yahweh that he was just really speaking to me about for some weeks. And, you know, it's it's such an incredible thing because the book of Esther, we know, is named after one of our most beloved female heroines in the pages of the Bible. Her story is so multi-layered. It's so inspirational, but we often forget that it's history. And that's the exciting part. History is exciting. Esther's story took place in an ancient empire whose ruins still lie in the desert of Iran, still to this very, very day. And to understand Esther, to understand her times, her decisions, her contemporaries, Temporaries, which Vashti was, we have to understand Persian history. And more particularly, we have to dig deep into the history that's presented in this biblical book. And in this study that I'm going to do with you today, we're not even going to touch on Esther. I've done so many teachings on Esther and, you know, things about her in the past. But today we are going to examine another heroine of the story, Vashti and her relationship to Xerxes and the Persian culture. Now you might be saying, well, why are you calling her a heroine? That is the fascinating look that we're going to be taking into the verses in chapter one, just chapter one of the book of Esther, a deep study into this night of feasting, a night of drinking, the night Xerxes disposed of his queen and revealed to us what the mighty men of Persia were scared of the most. That is what we're going to see in this chapter. So let's go on to the book itself. Now, we know that the book of Esther detailing our story was written in 470 BC. Now, we need to know the history. I want to pause here before going a bit further and say to you this, that we, you know, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, the writings, throughout these beautiful stories, we have been reading of Hebrew culture. We have been learning about Israel. We are connecting with our people, Israel. But right in the middle of all of this, we have the book of Esther. It is so, so kind of, I wouldn't say 
ignorant, but I, I would say we are falling a step short. If we go in to the book of Esther with the same mindset that we read the Torah with. The Torah was set in a specific time, a specific period. It's, you know, different time frames, of course, because in the beginning we have Adam and Eve and we have Abraham and then we have the Israelites and then we have, you know, the wilderness experience. So it's a whole time frame and it's a different kind of experience and the culture that's happening there is specific. Right in the middle of our Old Testament, we have this book, the book of Esther. It's written in a place that is very, very different from ancient Israel. It's written in the Persian Empire, which is an, was an incredible empire, very strong at this stage where we find Esther. And in order to understand her, to understand Vashti, Xerxes, everything that's happening, we need to know about their culture. And this is what I want to say. This book is dropped in the middle and we just go in and we we feed on Esther's story because we find that we can understand her. You know, we understand her as a Jewish orphan, as an Israelite woman in a different place, uh, in a different culture, but we don't understand the culture. And many times I've been, you know, heard people teach on the book of Esther, but I've never really heard people talking about the history and the culture of Persia, which is so important. We need to understand it. Now, the book of Esther itself, the book was written in 470 BC, and this is nine years that the story was written after Esther was crowned queen of Persia. It's placed alongside Ezra and Nehemiah in our biblical canon as its events speak to the condition and the lifestyle of the exiled Jewish people and their return to rebuild the ruined Jerusalem. Now, as a conquered nation, you know, freedom looked different to many different people. It depends who's taking freedom, who's staying behind, because some of the Jews, they returned to Jerusalem and they were living back in the land, but others stayed on in Persia. And the events in Esther occurred actually 30 years earlier than the book of Nehemiah. The events document there and then some of the scholars really believe that it might have been Ezra or Nehemiah who wrote Esther's story who actually wrote it down but what's important to note is that a remnant had returned to Judea and others had stayed behind and many many Jewish people at this stage rose to prominence among the Persian courts so they rose to high positions and you know what We can be sitting and going, oh, okay, you know, Xerxes and, you know, he didn't know anything about the Jews and, you know, all of the Jewish people, they were just doing their thing. I've heard many, many people tell me, you know, for example, with the Babylonian exile. Now, in order to understand the Babylonian exile, we need to understand what that meant to the Jewish people. But I've also had a lot of people say to me, oh, the Jews arrived in Babylon, you know, after the temple was destroyed and they arrived there and they were just slaves and they were ill-treated. That's not actually the case when we read uh, what's happening there because Yahweh actually gave them a promise when they went to Babylon that they must plant vineyards and they must live there and Yahweh will bless them and they must seek the good of the empire where they were living, which kind of must have baffled their minds thinking this is a pagan society and yet we must seek the good. And you know, a lot of the Jewish people, even in Babylon before the Persian empire came and obviously overthrew that, that was happening. We know that a lot of the Jewish people rose to prominence. Some of them made a name for themselves and a lot of them rose to, you know, divine scholarship. Some of them rose to high positions and acquired wealth for themselves. Same happened in Persia. When Persia came along, this is what happened. A lot of the Jews didn't decide to return to Judea. Why? Because if they were just slaves and they were just living bad, you know, the the temptation to return would have been more, but not so. You know, a lot of them did rise to places of prominence among the Persian courts. And the Persian kings, let me tell you something, they were no strangers to their Jewish subjects. And that's what I want us to look at. You know, some like Mordecai, later Nehemiah, these are only ones documented in the scriptures. They actually worked for the kings and served them. And the Persian kings are actually vitally important in the Bible. Do you know that? The Persian kings are prominent in the Bible and in the movements of the Jewish people. And so I want to tell you about some of the kings that were connected to the Jewish people. We know in 539 BC that Cyrus, who was Persian, captured Babylon. Remember what I said you know just a few seconds ago Babylon was the place and this is where a lot of the Jewish people were and then Cyrus captured Babylon he overthrew the Median king and by doing so Cyrus became the ruler of both Media and 
and Persia. He released the Jewish people from captivity. He decreed they could return to their original homeland, which is actually a prophecy that Yahweh gave in the Bible that he would call to Cyrus a man that didn't even know him and he would use him for this. And you know, Zerubbabel and a small Judean remnant returned. They spent a year rebuilding the temple, but then enemy opposition halted the work. And so Cyrus was ordained by Yahweh to release the Jewish people. And a number of prophecies, like I said, were written in the Bible about this king, about Cyrus, how he would release the people. It was all by the work and the hand of Yahweh, even though Cyrus didn't even serve Yahweh. So this is what was beautiful. In 521, that saw Darius crowned as king, Cyrus Cyrus' son and Darius became king and the following year he issued a decree to rebuild the temple of Yahweh. So look at what they are doing. This would take four years to complete. We know in 486 Xerxes became king and he would rule between 486 and 465 BC. He is the featured king in the story so I'm not going to tell you too much about him because we're going to look at him throughout the text as we get into it. And then 465 BC was his son Artaxerxes and he was the king before whom Nehemiah served and this king he issued a decree again all of these kings are issuing these great decrees for the Jewish people. He issued the decree saying the Jewish people can return and he gave them enough backing so that they could return to their homeland and Ezra returned with another remnant 13 years later Nehemiah who was the cupbearer to Artaxerxes at the time he heard of the ruined walls and remember what it says in the book of Nehemiah that he appeared before the king serving him and he was in a state of sadness and he had never ever appeared before Artaxerxes like that and it says that Artaxerxes was sitting on the throne with the queen next to him and asked Nehemiah what was happening and Nehemiah got goes on and tells him about the ruined walls and his people. And so a second decree was issued and Nehemiah then returned with letters from Artaxerxes as well as financial aid for the ailing remnant. And now Artaxerxes, and this is very, very important for what we're going to get into today in this teaching, Artaxerxes was born in the same year that his mother Vashti was removed from her royal position. Very, very important. Take note. The Greek historians call her a mistress. And if you read a lot about a mistress in history, she was a very, very bad person. So Vashti, the name Vashti, cannot be found in history. And so many, many scholars assert and put it together that the Greek historians, that she is a mistress. You know that that was what her name was in the Greek and how they referred to her. And again, she was a very, very colorful character if Vashti and Amestris were the same person, which we cannot say for sure. We cannot say for sure. We're all we're going to focus on today and looking in Esther chapter one is what we're going to read in the text. So let's get into it. Xerxes declared a time of feasting. And it said that in the third year of Xerxes' reign, he declared a time of feasting, an extended time lasting six months. For 180 days, he showed his wealth, his vast wealth and splendor of his kingdom to the military leaders and nobles and to the princes. This is found in Esther 1 verse 1 to 4. Now, the feasting took place at the Winter Palace in Susa. You know, they had many different palaces, but the Winter Palace in Susa was absolutely exquisite. And it was supposed to solidify his rule. You know, his position as the great king, he was called King of Kings, which we see many times in the Persian writings and also obviously at the palaces itself. There was this reality that he was the great King of Kings, the great king of the mighty and vast Persian Empire. And Xerxes is there, you know, having this time of feasting for six months which is a very, very long time. And he's showing all the nobles, all the princes, everybody of not only his kingdom, but neighboring kingdoms, his wealth and also his power. This was to show what he had, to show 
who he was and to show him as the great king of kings and to show that he was large and in charge of absolutely everything this wasn't just hey come around for dinner and let's let's have a chat this was a very very strong power play and again this was because there were battles that he was going to face off with Greece soon after this and so it was a display that I'm coming I have everything I'm powerful and I'm going to you know pillage this Greek army and the Greeks and the Persians were continually at battle with each other at this stage so we read in Esther 1 and specifically in verse 4 we read Xerxes first personal action in the story in other words the very first thing that's his personal action that he's actually doing personally and it's found in the word show or display so he was a man like I said showing off his wealth this is the first action. How is Xerxes introduced to us in the book of Esther? By the word show. He is showing. He is displaying. He was in essence looking around and showing others what he had, what he ruled over, what was in his power and why he deserved to be in this place of rulership. His possessions were underneath his control and he was a master of it all. And this is his personal reality. This is what's happening. And after the 180 days of feasting, Xerxes extended the drinking and the festivities this time he added a banquet lasting seven days inside the enclosed garden of the king this was to be open to everybody not just the nobles and the princes who were feasting for six months but commoners could come as well the bible actually tells us that the decor was first class it was fit for a king verse 8 tells us the drinking was carried on in accordance with the law and no one was compelled to drink for the king had directed each official of his household to comply with each guest's wishes and so this is our first introduction to the reality that persian law dominated everything the writer of esther almost seems to to mock this or scoff at this point you know he seems to be saying yeah you will see this reality of law in almost all the chapters of the book of esther and the writer is saying it's quite ridiculous really that everything including the drinking including how much you drink and how much you eat is actually controlled by law for these seven days this you know was waived now imagine the scene men drinking for over six months and now there's this intimate banquet there's no law regarding how much you could drink in other words you know what drink until you fall down or drink nothing at all you decide it's all got to do with your moral compass or what or how you think you are and this suggests again that the drinking was controlled by a king's law that was actually waived at this specific banquet that last seven days and our first introduction of Vashti herself is right here in verse 9 where the reader is told that she is holding a separate banquet for the woman in Xerxes palace now that is very very specific again there's no uncertainty here Xerxes is the ruler and everything is his Vashti was queen but she's queen in the palace only and she has a position that's far away from the court we see Esther in a very very similar role in chapter 4 where she knows nothing about the decree against the Jewish people and again in her confession she had said in chapter 4 when we look at Esther she says well I haven't been summoned to the king in over a month queens have a place in this empire and it's not within the front lines of political power it's not within the front lines of influence there is no doubting Vashti has a separate banquet just for the ladies and it's in the palace of Xerxes while everything that he has he is showing he is the master of everything and he himself is on display for everyone to see so what's going to happen it's the one 10 to 12 tells us the following on the seventh day when the king's heart was joyful with wine in high spirits he commanded Memuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abaktha, Zethar and Carcass the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of king of Ahasuerus now Ahasuerus is obviously how it's said in Hebrew and so that's how it is written here but it is Xerxes so it says to bring Queen Vashti before the queen before the king wearing her royal crown high turban to display her beauty before the people and the officials for she was lovely to see but Queen Vashti refused to come 
at the king's command, which was delivered to her by the eunuchs. So the king became extremely angry and he burned with rage. High spirits, drunk parties, feasting and drinking. You know, this chaos really inflamed the heart of Xerxes and overindulgence led him to desire to show the world this one final possession that he had not yet put on display. You know, like I said, this first reality that we see him doing, his first personal action is all about showing. So, of course, he's going to want to show the final possession he has that he has not shown to the whole world. It's like marrying the, the, the best actress of, you know, Hollywood, the most Miss World or Miss Universe or the most beautiful woman, you know, that people have ever seen and laid their eyes on before. Because this is what the Bible is saying, that she was lovely to see, you know, ooh, lovely to look at. She must have been everything that there was to look at at that stage. And he wants to put this on display. It's now become very, very personal. I want to put, you know, this, he's got this ego going and I want to put on my wife on display here. And Vashti is his queen, you know, this, she's a wife, but she's also queen of the entire nation. And she is actually summoned to show herself before drunken mob people don't realize this and we never stop to pause and think about this i mean how many times have you been in a situation and maybe it, the situation turned quite bad because i know a lot of people that have been in this situation where they've been at a party or they've been somewhere and there's drunk people around them there's no controlling what drunk people do and a lot of women have had intensely negative bad experiences being around men that are drunk assault happens rape happens you know we don't know what state Xerxes is in I'm sure he wouldn't have let his maybe let his wife have been manhandled but there's a reality that's happening here this is an unsafe environment Xerxes is he's just playing into his own ego he's playing into I've got to show everything and I'm going to show what I have and it's this woman and a lot of men do that you know we see a lot of worldly men that marry women and these women are just put on display oh it's kind of like look at what I have look at look at who I am and what I've been able to accomplish and he desires nothing else but to show off what he possesses and Vashti is nothing more to him than this possession that he has to show to others it is cold and it's cruel and it's dangerous and she refused and the rabbis say that it's very very possible that Xerxes expected Vashti to appear to to this intense crowd only wearing the crown because the crown is mentioned here in Esther chapter 1 but little else is mentioned so they say that it's very very possible that you know Xerxes expected the queen to appear just with the crown on wearing nothing else and that was why she refused to come but perhaps there's more because the history of the times like I always said could give the answers now remember what I said earlier on Vashti's son Artaxerxes was born in 483 BC and this is the very, very year that Xerxes has this elaborate feasting time. So at this stage, she's either pregnant or she has just given birth. Now, in those days, it's not like it is today. Birthing was painful and your body would need a long time to recover. Because the we don't know, maybe she was in labor for a long time or at this stage, she could be very close to giving birth. So the history of the times tell us that we have a woman who's about to become a mother and she's in a very delicate state or else she has just become a mother. So these two things are just showing that Xerxes has no concern or compassion for his wife. It doesn't matter that this is her reality. All that matters is that she must come. Verse 8 and verse 9 here in chapter 1 actually carries an interesting homophone. And a homophone is two things that sound very, very similar. And verse 8 begins with the word vehashtia, which means to drink and the drinking. So verse 8 says, and the drinking was happening. And then verse 9 begins with vehashti. If you look at this in the original Hebrew, Hebrew you, you will see that there are two words here that look almost identical. And so verse 8 begins with, and the drinking was happening. And verse 9 begins with, and Vashti. So the connection between these two can also give us an answer. There's play on words here happening in the original. The drinking was not pleasing to Vashti. 
Vashti. And it's possible that she refused to come because the men were drunk. And it was a precarious situation. She was a woman of pride. You know, she was a woman of upstanding realities. She's a a queen of it, this vast and powerful empire. We don't know about her own inner working, whether she was a woman of, of intense pride or vanity. We don't know those things. But she was a woman of pride. And she knew that no matter what her case was, whether it was that she was pregnant or the drinking was bothering her or she just didn't want to come in the manner in which he wanted her to come, well, she refused. And Xerxes, he was undone. He was angry. He was wrathful. And his possession would not be displayed. And Vashi will forever be remembered as the woman who said no, who said no to the great king of kings. And for that, we have all but looked at this and said, oh, but Vashti is a bad person. What was bad about what Vashti did? What was bad about saying no to a situation like this? Although she was queen of the strongest nation in the world, Vashti had little power, except she did have personal power. It's the same that you and I have. She could not control the court or the world that she lived in, but she could control her choices. She could raise her voice. She could summon all the courage she possessed and say no to being used as nothing more than a possession or as a form. And she did just that. We know nothing about Vashti's history. The rabbis say that she was vain, that she was idolatrous. History cannot find her. We cannot find her in normal history. And so if we consider how little we know about her perhaps let us just pause and that's what i want us to do and decide on her character based on this one moment we can go all over the show and try and find a vashti but let us just consider that she was who she appears to be right here in the book of esther a moment one moment found in the first chapter of the book of her successor Esther. Historians, like I said, struggle to find her. We cannot take the rabbi's opinions as final because, again, it's just their commentary. And so she's almost extended in history. You know, she's held up there as just, you know, someone that was, and we only see her, yeah. And so Vashti, you know, she's vilified in theology. But for what exactly? I've heard so many bad sermons preached on Vashti. And I want to just pause for a moment and say, and ask you to consider this. If you were Vashti and your husband was doing exactly what I just described to you, would you appear before him naked, pregnant or before drunk people? Because refusing to be accosted, refusing to be abused or mistreated, well, that's something that all of us should have the power to say no to. Because Vashti exercised personal power and the right for every woman to say no when ordered to do something that goes against their character. We are at Vashti when we say no to abuse, when we say no to things that make us uncomfortable, when we say no, I'm not going to do that. And that goes against who I am, my morals, my spirit, who I am called to be. You know, we are Vashti when we stand on the sidewalk and protest against abuse. We are Vashti when we refuse to be judged by the things we eat or the figures that we have or our intelligence for being highly intelligent or anything else. But you know what? When we hear the word no, all we think about is negatives. But no is such a positive word in so many ways. It means that we have the power to set clear boundaries and we are called by Yahweh to set clear boundaries. And that's something that faith people don't want to hear. You don't want to hear that you're allowed to set a boundary because it requires something of you to set that boundary. You know, faith people always just say, well, let us just love, 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 love. Doesn't matter how other people treat us. Doesn't matter. That's not the word of Yahweh. The word of Yahweh has called us to set clear boundaries. The word of Yahweh has said, you guard your heart. The word of Yahweh says that no is positive in many ways. The word of Yahweh says you avoid toxic situations and you let go of toxic relationships. You guard your heart because out of it is, flows the sources of life. If I was Vashti in those days, I would have also said no. I pray I had the courage to say no. Because to say no meant that she had to summon so much courage. Because she knew what would happen if she said no. She still said it. 
To centuries old, gatekeepers of theology have always disliked Vashti because the gatekeepers were all men. The church fathers and the theological fathers that have interpreted the Bible have all interpreted Vashti as a bad person. But when you look at women, women like me, women that have begun to look at the Bible led by the Spirit of Yahweh and allowed Him to interpret the Bible for you as a woman, then things change. Men interpreting Scripture based on their understanding, their suspicion, their hatred even of women. The church fathers hated women. If you go and look and read what they said about women, it will just make your stomach turn. And yet, you know what, theirs is the same laughable, sad behavior of Xerxes and his court. Because Xerxes became enraged with her rebellious behavior and and her flat out refusal of, you know, appearing before him in whatever way. So in this moment here, in Esther chapter 1, he turns to his officials and asks, hey, what is to be done now that she doesn't want to come before me? This queen who birthed his son, the queen that's held as the most beautiful woman in the land, praised by all, very much a part of Xerxes' life. Well, what is to be done to this queen simply because she said no? Can you imagine that? That is a crazy reality and it's happening so quickly in the verses before us. And before we dig into what the court actually answered, we really have to think deeply about the situation. And again, I'm going to sum it up for you like this. A drunk party, an innocent woman inside of her home, summoned to suddenly appear before drunk strangers in a state of pregnancy or otherwise without any prior warning, without any prior information, just because Xerxes, the king of the empire, suddenly desires her to parade for a stream of strangers. It's a horrible situation. It's a sad one, and Vashti is not at all to blame for this situation. And this is what actually happened. So we read now, and we have to ask ourselves, Vashti said no, there's all this feasting happen, happening, what is now going to happen? Esther 1, 16 to 18, it tells us. Memucan answers and says, Vashti the queen has not only wronged the king, but all the officials, royal representatives, and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's conduct will become known to all women. Note how many times the word all is used here, causing them to look on their husbands with contempt, disrespect, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she did not come. For the queen's conduct will become known to all women, causing them to look on their husbands like this. And this very day, the ladies of Persia and Medea who have heard of the queen's refusal will speak in the same way to all the king's officials. And there will be plenty of contempt and plenty of anger. Right here in the beginning of this book, the world of king and queen, man and woman, husband and wife are clearly outlined. It's clear and it's concise. Law and protocol prevail. And the nobles of Persia called wise men who understand the signs of the times, as it says here in Esther chapter 1. These men, they have a singular fear and they make it known right here. They fear a woman's uprising. They fear the overturning of patriarchy and the power that they hold. It's so sadly ridiculous, but it's highly contrasted, you know, by the fact that later on in Esther's story, Haman would incite an uprising against an entire people group without a single voice of opposition in the court. Think about it like that. Here we have these men and they're saying, oh, all women everywhere would con- be contemptuous and disrespectful to all their husbands and all the nobles and all the people will hear about and all the kingdom will be in uproar. There is this fear that women are not going to know their place, the place that these men want them to have. And yet later when Haman just wants to destroy an entire people group, not a single voice, forget about all, but not a single voice would be in opposition. Memucam's words are such an exaggeration. It's unlike Likely that Vashti's refusal would have incited all of the women of the empire to rebel. Sure, maybe it would have, you know, made some people think or made people fearful. Who knows what would have happened? That this 
underlies the fear that these men held so deep within. And so because they had this fear, what do they do? They enact another law. It seems very similar to how the governments work today. You know, when when they just don't want people to do something, they just put out another law out there. These guys do exactly the same. The law that they put out there says that every man is to rule over his own home. Everyone. Everyone is to rule over their own home. And so that's what has to happen. All men, they must be the ruler. So that women will never exercise the right to disobey. Furthermore, they strip women of the ability to teach their children in their own language. And so since ancient times, we've inherited that term mother tongue as a point of truth. It is true, mother tongue, because for centuries, women were the primary teachers of their children. And so children would grow up speaking and learning the language of their mother. And now suddenly the Persian court decides, nope, we're going to outlaw this practice. Even though women are teaching their children in their homes and are the ones that are primary educators in the home, and that's how it's always been. They want to say, no, you know what, we, you, because of what Vashti did, this is causing a problem to us, we're going to overturn this whole thing. Women need to be reminded of their place, that not only can they never refuse to do anything, especially their husband or other men, but they have no voice of empowerment, no language of their own, and no way to be a living human being. Vashti would have known what was to become of her if she refused to appear before the king but she still said no and that showed that she had incredible courage to stand against that which wasn't right and that same courage would be summoned by Esther when she used her voice to save the Jewish people what Esther and Vashti do are similar in so many ways because it was the female voice from the start of the book of Esther straight through to the end of the book of Esther that needed to find its place Vashti teaches us that saying no sometimes is going to cost us but it is always worth it esther teaches us that to speak up even when the risk is death well that that is sometimes what we have to do both women had to find the power of their own voices and both women knew that they were risking their lives when they did unfortunately for vashti you know it resulted in her being cut off fortunately it made a way that yahweh was working He was working and he was going to put Esther in a unique position. But again, she would become the queen of this empire, have little influence or power, but still she had to decide to use her voice. You know what? Vashti did something so, so courageous. What happened to her is very uncertain. We don't know what happened to her. Yet, in Xerxes' anger and in his injured pride, maybe his poor sense of judgment because of all the feasting, he resented her and he never saw her again. The heat of emotion in a moment is blinding and this moment would change everything. It would change every single thing, especially for our father's people. Esther chapter 2 then starts. We've only been in, in chapter 1. Now I want to end off with this. Esther chapter 2 tells us later when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. The jump between the end of chapter 1 and the start of chapter 2 is something we turn the page and continue reading, but a significant amount of time has passed between the feasting that he had and the now. Added to this, what happened in this time is that Xerxes had lost one of the most significant battles in history, the Battle of Salamis. This is such a specific battle and it's so important. Xerxes had won many battles and his naval battle at the Strait of Salamis seemed a certain victory. You know, on paper, it looked that way. A certain victory against the Greeks, yet all did not go according to the plan. The Greeks gained the victory, Xerxes retreated, and the course of the continual Greek-Persian war shifted. Remember what I told you, Greece and Persia were continue at war with one another for power and control of the world, the known world at that time, and whose empire was going to be the leading empire. The battle, this particular battle, this one that happened between chapter 1 and chapter 2, it reduced the Persian influence and Greece continued pushing forward. It increased its territorial holdings, got more territory for its empire and this eventually meant that Greek culture would expand and it would influence the world as we know it. Historians have actually called this battle that Xerxes fought significant to the history and outlay of our world. Our world 
as we know it today, believe it or not. It was so influenced by Greek culture and Greek living. Even so many of our names are influenced and come from the Greek language. That's the reality. And what happened here was that Xerxes returned home seeking comfort and seeking solace. You know, he's lost this battle. He knows that it's incredibly significant. The Bible tells us here that he remembered Vashti. He remembered her, but it's not, the words don't indicate in the original that there's any emotion. Rather, the original words whisper of the severity of the offense. Because it says not only did he remember her, but he remembered what she had done and the decree that he had set forth in place. So Xerxes actually still feels the sting of anger against her. It's probably rejection and failure, one on top of the other, losing this battle and, you know, coming home, not quite so much the king of kings anymore, but now also remembering what happened with his wife. And, you know, with with this, a new proposal is made. A new queen is to be found. Her position needs to be filled and Xerxes needs to find a wife and a new woman enters the scene. This is time and a start actually for something new without him even realizing it. And this is the moment that our Esther, the chosen woman who again would use her voice, not just for herself, but for others as well. It's a time where she is ushered in to exactly where she needs to be. You know, like many people say, The book of Esther almost, you know, seems to be written without Yahweh in it, but it's not so. You know, everything about the book of Esther speaks about Abba Father. But I think that the big thing about this is that as much as we love the book of Esther, and I know women that I meet continually and all the time love Esther, we love that moment where she rises up and goes before the king. I hear it all the time. Maybe you call for such a time as this. We need to find another scripture, by the way, because that one is being overused a little bit. I hear it all the time, though, that women say, I love Esther. I love her story because she went before the king, you know, and she saved this people. She saved a nation of people who would bring forth the Messiah. And that's absolutely true. And I love Esther myself because she summoned courage. But as much as what we look up to Esther for summoning courage to go before the king we have to look at Vashti as well maybe Yahweh hid his name from this book because he wanted his daughters and the woman of Yahweh to see themselves in the story he wanted all of us because that's what he wants for all of us not to be overshadowed by just the spiritual reality or the religious reading of the story but it's for us to find ourselves in him for us to find the power of our voice for us to find the power of our passion for us to find what we are really called to because that's why Yeshua looked at Peter and said you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my congregation Peter first had to become who Peter was destined to be And so that reality shifts everything. You've got to find who you created to be with your unique name, your unique stamp, your unique voice, your unique calling, your unique gifting, your unique why in this life. That is what it's got to come down to. Vashti was told, go away. You're not going to be here anymore because she knew who she was. And even if she wasn't such a good person, she knew that she was not going to compromise on what was important to her. And I don't blame her in this situation. She said no to something that was wrong. And there's nothing wrong with saying no to something like that. So let us pray together. Father, we just want to say thank you that you have given us a voice. Father, you do not want our voice to be overshadowed by the world, the wants of the world, the voice of the world, the things of this world. Father, you want us to be able to set boundaries in our lives with people, boundaries in our relationships, boundaries in our hearts. Father, you want us to be able to say no to things that are wrong. You want us to be able to intercede when things are wrong. Father, the greatest change makers in this world said no when things were wrong. They said no to things like slavery. They said no when there's realities of human trafficking or social injustices or hurting people or broken people. Throughout the centuries, Abba Father, you raise no people up to say no, to say this is not okay. And Father, even Esther said no, no to what Haman wanted to do, no to the destruction of a people. No towards keeping quiet and no towards the fear of losing her life. 
for what you were calling her to do. May we be no people, Abba Father. We always say, let's be the yes man or the yes person. But Father, let us be people that say no. No towards the things that are not okay in this world. Father, help us summon every bit of courage and even more so. Help us be like you said to Joshua. Be strong. Be courageous. For I will be with you wherever you go. Only be strong and be courageous. That was a commandment you gave him. You gave it to him so many times. You be strong. You be courageous. That's a choice, Abba Father, that you give us. May we be so strong. May we be so courageous, Abba Father, to say no when the situation requires it of us. And Father, may we be people that, yes, use our voice, Father, to advance and expand the kingdom of Abba Father in this very dark world. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that in it we can see ourselves. Thank you that in it there are messages for us today. Thank you that in it, Father, we are becoming a new generation of women who are not willing to stand and just allow ourselves to be mistreated, Father, and not allow others to be mistreated. Help us become these women that you created us to be. Father, people that are not going to just settle, but Father, people that are going to make a difference. We love you, Yeshua. I pray that you will bless our day today, that you will be with us, that you will strengthen us in a hard time that we find ourselves in, in this world. Heal the world, Father. Be with us in this time. Be with us in this place and help us find more strength and encouragement from your word because you are the King of Kings and we exalt you as that. Yeshua, we praise you. We glorify. We honor you today. Proclaim your name above all the noise. We proclaim your name above the streets, the cities, everything, above disease, above people, above our families father above our loved ones we proclaim your name messiah yeshua king of kings amen i want to say thank you so much for being with me today and for you know enjoying this teaching with me i pray that you have got to this point that you didn't push pause earlier on but this is such a great time of encouragement saying this teaching to someone that you know needs to hear it today and subscribe to the channel do not forget and even those who are listening who are subscribed you will not receive any notifications about new teachings unless you click on the bell on this channel we release so many new teachings all the time but you need to click on the bell because only then will you receive the notifications go on over to the website treasuredinheritanceministry.com and you can get the notes for this that you can share with your small group or you can share with other women but most importantly stay blessed may abba father be the center of your everything thanks for joining me until next time shalom shalom